Do you ever ask yourself, am I playing too small? Have I left it too late to start afresh? Will I come to the end of my life and feel that I somehow let myself down? This is your invitation to hear from some amazing people who have asked themselves those very same questions and chose to wake the F up, to get off the hamster wheel of mediocrity and seize the life that was calling them. Be inspired and be challenged to discover who you have the potential to become and the contribution you're here to make. And now, here to guide you on the most important quest of your life is your host, Janet Hogan. My next guest is on a mission to find someone with a heart as big as their pockets. While some people spend their weekends renovating their apartment, her dream is to renovate a whole neighbourhood, one of the most impoverished in Canada. She wants to see it transform into a place where you have people pushing prams, not drugs, where you hear the screams of children in a water park instead of screams of ambulances from people with overdoses. What she's proposing is a whole new take on the concept of affordable housing, where the homeless have a place they can call home and be proud of it. It's a long way off from that now. And to add to her challenge, she has four kids of her own to raise, not to mention a billion dollars to make her dream a reality. Cherie White, welcome to Wake the F Up. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. You know, Sheree, I, I know some people um, probably think you're crazy, but if that's the case, then the world needs more crazies like you in it. Please share what a, a nice middle class woman like you is doing in what many people would describe as the last place in the world they'd want to live. What, what brought you here to this moment in time? Sure. So my background is with the Salvation Army. Um, I'm very uh, privileged in order to have a, I had a grandfather that was uh, raised in, in the Salvation Army. And so from when I was a very little girl, I had this wonderful grandfather that would sing uh, gospel songs over me when he would put me to bed at night and would just uh, believed in me from such a such a young age and same with my father and so there's a social justice aspect that I believe is a generational something that was passed on to me from generation to generation and growing up around my dad I know that th- my dad had First Nations pictures all over his house and First Nations art was important and it, and people groups that were oppressed were often in my family uh, seen as an equal. And so there was a Salvation Army radical movement called uh, 614 in the downtown east side. My husband and I were privileged enough to come and live out our faith. And we got to build relationships with those that are considered, um, well, definitely financially uh, poor, but also uh, poor in many other ways. And so this challenge to become a part of a community that was all about social justice and was all about wanting to help others uh, seemed incredibly attractive to myself and my husband. And uh, we thought that we could yeah, live out our faith and not just go to a, a Sunday morning service and then we go home and to a suburb and kind of be nice. That seemed a little bit boring to me, but what seemed really exciting was joining this community that wanted to get their hands dirty and wanted to really learn to love their neighbor. And so um, my husband and I moved down there. I was pregnant with my third child at the time. And uh, I started to really get to know people and, and visit them in their really difficult homes and share my home with them. And it was just all about building community and loving your neighbor. Yeah, I, you really do take that, you know, that, that line, love thy neighbor. It was even the name of a, a, a TV series, wasn't it, at one stage? Almost becomes so much part of our language, we don't really even think about it. And probably loving my yeah. neighbor is the very last thing we're doing. We're living in such isolated uh, units. Mm. So, so t- tell us, uh, Shri, about your neighbours. Um, give us some examples of 
some of the people who live in your neighborhood so we can get a picture of that neighborhood. Sure. A lot of the women uh, that are uh, on the corners are, are prostituting for drugs. A lot. I would use language like they are being raped daily. They are oppressed. I have built a lot of relationships with uh, women that are, I would say, stuck in this place. The women that I've spoken to don't want to be there. You know, there is a a narrative of people, of women that are choosing this, but in my neighborhood, that's not the case. They will all say, I don't want to be there. And when Mm -hmm. I ask them, what is your dream? We'll call her Anne. Anne, what's your dream? What do you really want to do? What did you want to do? What were you going to do before this? And they said, Shri, I I don't know how to dream anymore. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten. I don't, I don't have any dreams. I just need to basically, now this is not what they would say, but basically need to get their next hit in order not to feel the pain of being raped repetitively throughout their day. So Mm. that's the, that's the women's perspective. A lot of men are drug dealers. They are. Yeah. Uh, Now I also want to be very, very clear. There is no judgment. There is no judgment for women that are in this place. In fact, I really do. They're my friends. They're my friends. And I I do care very, very much about them and their future. And sometimes I think that I might be have enough dreams that I might be able to start to dream with them. And so I just want to be really clear. Like I I get that they believe that their their mindset is that they're in a place that they have to be in this place. This is what they were told from a very young age, that this is all that they are worth. They are worthless. Their only purpose is here is to serve men. And that's my neighbor. Like literally that's my neighbor. I live beside a brothel in the downtown East side. And so we reach out to, I reached out to these women and made friendships with these women. A lot of men, like I said, are drug dealers. Most of them are drug dealers. But there is also families that live down there. There is also children that live there. And the media likes to portray my neighborhood as this place that you just don't go anywhere near. And I just want to say as a Salvationist growing up, we go to the fire, we don't run away from the fire. And so we wanted to make a massive impact and make a difference in this neighborhood. And I, I believe that we have. So the media likes to portray uh, the neighborhood as a place that you just don't go at all. And I think, and so the, the families that live there, the poor families that live there, they get no voice. They're mm-hmm. just completely disregarded by the, na- by the media because they don't have a dramatic story. Uh, they're not, they're not the, the shooting on the corner, although we don't have a lot of shootings because there's a lot of guns in the neighborhood, uh, lots of stabbings, uh, once in a while a shooting, uh, and definitely lots of uh, mental illness, for sure, people that are struggling, people that it's just the people that have been forgotten, um, yeah. that are re- roaming the streets and don't know where to go. Nobody mm. cares about them. And uh, I just, yeah. So that's, that's the people that are in my neighborhood. They're the people that want the, lots of nonprofits <laughs> that want to make impact families and women that are oppressed and men that are selling drugs. Mm. Yeah. Do you differentiate uh, between the men and women in terms of is one group better off than another? Or do you see that they, they're all stuck in that same uh, trap essentially? I think that they're both stuck in poverty. I think they're stuck in a poverty of a mindset. And I think that they're stuck financially in a poverty. So Shri, I want to talk to you a bit more about your vision, but I'm imagining, you know, uh, a place where the physical amenities are much, much better. You know, people have a proper roof over their head, but that's one aspect of it. But like you said, it's the mindset that's an issue as well. How do you influence that? What, what do you think, what's, what's your idea there as to how you get people out of this, this way of thinking that's been so deeply programmed into them? Yeah, I think community is really the answer to that, just like you and me. My friends, they mm-hmm. influence my mindset. When I sit down with a good close friend and I say, hey, this is the issue I'm going through, they're, they're, they're not trained psychologists, but they're friends. Mm-hmm. 
And they'll right. give me, you know, they'll say, hey, Sharia, this is what I think about this. And that might shift my mindset on a particular issue. Now, I know mindset goes much deeper. And so I think that the answer to people that are stuck, that have lost their ability to dream is by becoming a friend and mm -hmm. modeling something different. The power of modeling is so huge. And we know that. And so uh, right from the very beginning, from the very first time, 18 years ago that we moved into the downtown east side, we opened our doors for meals. And we, now, like you mentioned, I have four children and I'm a mama bear and I will protect my children just like most mothers. And I'm not just going to open my door to strangers that are, you know, having lots of mental issues and lots of, uh, that's on crack to say, come on in relationship was built before I opened my door and say, Hey, why don't you come and into my, uh, come and join us at our table. Why don't you share a meal with us? So when mm -hmm. I get to a place that I feel comfortable with a friend say, why don't you come in and, and come into our house? And this is where family is modeled. This is where mindsets I think start to change is when they can see a mother care for their children. They see a father that's, sits at a table and laughs with their kids at the end of the day. They're like, whoa, whoa, like, this is not how I was raised. Like, what is happening yeah. here? And that is where we've seen the biggest change in people is when they get to see something modeled. And I have to say, it's exactly the same for me. When I'm learning a new skill, I want to see how it works. I want to see it modeled for me so that mm -hmm. I can be successful at that new skill and so mm -hmm. that's how we build community and that's how we see people change and, and you know I had one of my friends say to me Sheree I had a friend and okay now I have to paint something I haven't painted yet in this conversation so a lot of people in my neighborhood live in something called SROs which stands for single room occupancies which means that there's one floor and you you get a tiny little room. It's like New York in that sense. Like it's, there's not a lot of space in Vancouver. So it gets tiny little room and you get one bathroom for about 10 people to share on that one floor, kind of like maybe college residence or something like yeah. that. And those, and all your worldly possessions have to be shoved into these SROs. And so one of my friends, I was started to come and visit regularly and her was, name was Roseanne and Roseanne, God bless her because she became a good friend of mine. And she came into my life. I have to tell you, she had more impact on my life than I had on hers. But one day she said to me, Sheree, I invited someone over to my space because you invited me over to your space. Mm -hmm. And I was so, so pleased about that because she was getting the power of modeling that she only had a 200 square foot room but that's what she had and she wanted to share it with someone else and I was like okay something's happening here this she's getting community and yeah. I, eventually I met her friend and so uh, the answer yeah. is the impact I think is in the modeling yeah that's very powerful because so much work in the if you like benefactor space is almost like administered from above sprinkling gifts and funds on the masses with no mm. integration or no real responsibility taken. So it's very interesting what you talk, what you say about the method that you have in modeling. It's yeah, it absolutely feels right when you describe it like that. That's so encouraging to hear. Uh, I, I remember when you mentioned the word, word Salvation Army, the fellow who married us um, 40 years ago <laughs> was um, worked for the Sallies, as we call them, the Salvation Army. And I loved him so much because he was a minister of religion, but not your classic type. He was absolutely pragmatic. And his whole thing, he, he played the trumpet too at our, um, at our wedding beautifully but his whole thing was all about uh, giving older people an experience of life so he drove a bus fantastic to people for people who were you know like 80 plus to weird and wonderful places so they could have a quality of life and he really taught me a lot about this pragmatic aspect of not just talking about not preaching from the pulpit but actually going right. out there with your sleeves rolled up so That's it's right. interesting to hear that you had that grounding in your grandfather and your father. Mm. What about, so I can see that that's given you a really firm foundation, 
But, you know, I'm human, you're human. It doesn't mean that we're bulletproof, does it? You know, it doesn't no, mean not in the that, slightest. That, yeah. that, we, that we we're impermeable to, you know, things like self-doubt and questioning our path and, and all of that. So could you, could you share with us what have been the toughest times for you in that mm-hmm. area, Shri, you know, where you felt at your most um, vulnerable in, the, in this yeah. line of work that you've chosen? Sure, absolutely. And it's not has anything to do with the, the downtown side. It actually is more on the business side of things. So five years ago, I decided that I was going to move from a full time position in the Salvation Army into real estate because housing was the piece that my friends couldn't get. They could rebuild relationships, they could find a job, but they couldn't get housing. And so I decided I was going to be the landlord that would provide the housing for my friends. So the first shall be last, because in Vancouver, there's a housing shortage. And as soon as you say that you're in recovery from addictions, the landlord would like put you at the last of the list. Like there's no way, right? Yeah. So I decided, okay, we're, you're going to be the first on my list and I'm going to purchase somehow because I had no money. <laughs> I'm working for the Salvation Army. And I was going to figure out a way to provide housing for my friends that were moving from a lifestyle of addictions to a lifestyle of I call freedom. And so I did that. And I started a business, uh, an investment business, and I learned all about real estate on the residential side. And I was doing very well. I figured it out. I figured out systems. I didn't know I was an entrepreneur actually until that point, until I moved away. And I started winning awards in my network. Like I got it until I didn't. And Mm -hmm. there was one day that I had made a, a huge error in my business and I hired someone to oversee my finances. And I, because I was alone, because I was isolated, because I was the top dog, because I was, I think, full of myself and my pride at that point in time, that I was so successful. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I'm looking back now. And I hired a guy to look after my finances off of Craigslist. And so this guy came in, he gave me a big spiel about how he was all about helping people and wanted to help the poor. And so he had all this business experience. And so I believed him. I didn't get any recommendations from anyone. And he came in and he actually manipulated me into giving company money to him. And he stole all sorts of money from my company. And that was the beginning of my downturn. And at that point, I was alone. I was scared. I didn't have the support of my husband and my family. And I didn't know where to go or what to do, but I knew I was in a lot of trouble. And so that probably was my most vulnerable point where I went to go and I found someone to go see. And they said, start exercising and start getting back to your faith. And so I did those two things. And it was the, it was the exercising, the getting up early in the morning and taking care of myself that I had those really, I'm going to say those really intimate talks with God, because here I am, I'm alone. I really just want to end everything. I'm full of fear. I don't know, like, I wouldn't say suicide was on the plate, but I would say that moving to Mexico and leaving my family and running and just trying to start off all over again was definitely on the plate. And it was those 6 a.m. hour walks that I tried to figure out, how do I start over again? What does that look like? What am I going to do with all this money that I, I owe, I owe people? I, I didn't know what to do. Mm. And so it's been a three year comeback. It's taken a long time to believe in myself again, to believe. And that was the thing. It was the identity piece that was being attacked. It was like, I don't know who I am anymore. Like in this moment of everything falling apart, I, I didn't know who I was. And I, I thought I was a good person, but now I've got everybody calling me and yelling at me. And I, I was just so lost. I was just so lost. But I, now I've been reminded, thank God for some people in my life that reminded me, Shri, you're not a bad person. 
You know, you made a mistake and a lot of people make mistakes in business. And yeah, it may take you three years to get back five years, 10 years even to recover. But with the right strategies and the right team around you, you can do this. And I started to believe that for myself. And so now I'm in a place that I have a wonderful board. I have a new company. I'm building community in large multifamily developments. I've moved from that business of investing in residential into into commercial and putting together strategies of rent to own so people can invest long-term in the neighborhood. And I'm so excited about what Steadfast Development's potential has, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't like take that six months off and figure out and be reminded of who I am. And so now I'm, I'm back and I'm strong and I just have a wonderful board. I have five fabulous development developers on my board with all sorts of experience. And I've put together a fantastic development uh, team that has multiple years of building experience and development experience. And so my development team and my board and I have investors that believe in me. Are, we're all moving towards this one goal together. So yeah, yeah, I'm good now. Yeah, I hear that. That I totally relate to that crash, by the way, and the, how identity gets caught up on the wrong hook. It's like, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when we think of addiction, we think of, you know, physical substances, alcohol, drugs, food, work sometimes. Sure. But we don't really talk about the addiction to a false identity so much, do we? Mm. You know, one that's um, yeah. maybe more ego-based. And when that mask gets ripped off, that hurts, doesn't it? That really hurts. Oh. And, oh, I, and yeah. I, I think it leaves us uh, momentarily blinded. That's the other thing. You know, you talk yeah. about who am I? It's like we're, we're walking around. With, we can't see feeling our way through a room that feels so unfamiliar to us. And then, you know, where yeah. the hell do we go from there? Yeah. So it has, would that describe the fundamental shift for you, Sheree? Do you think that you've gone from maybe an egoic self to uh, you've got out of your own way and you can see clearly now that you're here for something other than just your own personal gratification? Would that be right? Absolutely. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I am so clear as to who I am now. I don't feel lost. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely affirmed in my identity and feel hugely supported. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with your vision that you have, I'd love to know, is this a vision that you feel is gaining traction? How are you going in that pursuit of getting funding? What's that journey like? Because this is a topic that comes up a lot in conversations I have, particularly with women. They say it's very, very hard uh, to get funding in what is basically, and I hate using the old cliche of white male dominated world because I'm, I'm not a fan of propagating cliches, but it seems to be true in the funding arena that that is an issue. Share with us how you've found that aspect of the journey. Yeah, that's definitely been the hardest piece. I would agree for sure. I don't think that the money piece necessarily has to do with being male or female. It is for sure. uh, Commercial developments is very much uh, male dominated, but I don't think that has anything to do with the uh, the financial piece. Like you used in the intro, the the people that I've found that are are my biggest supporters are people that I call social impact investors. So they want to see the big hearts and big pockets. They want to see their money not sit in a bank. They're often not people that have $7 million and say, oh, $7 million is not enough for me. I need another 20 million in order to be happy. And then once they get 20 million, they usually say, oh, I need another 50 million. And before you know it, like that's just their whole mindset. These are investors that want to see their money being put into a place that is changing lives and are supporting and preventing homelessness. And I I really want to stress that. So Steadfast is not necessarily picking up the people that are already fallen into poverty, but we're looking at the rung up right up top, the the women and children that are about to fall into poverty. So I have a friend, she's one of my best friends now, and she had her children and she was living in her car and she had nowhere to go. And she was hopping from couch to couch 
and hoping that the next month that she would be able to find a place in Vancouver. These are the families that we are targeting. We want to be the, the net to hold these families from actually falling into to poverty. So preventiveness is, is a, a huge thing. I imagine it's such a spiral. Once they fall into that, it's very hard to climb back out, isn't it? Exactly. So if we're going to stop poverty in our neighborhood, we need to look at the rung above it and we can stop there. And over 5, 10, 15 years, we can have women and families in our neighborhood invested long term with the Rent to Own program that they're going to see their children grow up and they're going to have a safe place and they can also be a part of our holistic part of our company, which provides social enterprise jobs as well as intentional community building. But I don't think that answers your question. I got off track. There was <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really Apologies. just, yeah, just hopeful are you that you will raise the funds. How, you know, a billion oh, dollars is, right. yeah. yeah. Big hearts, big, <laughs> right. I, it's very interesting. I find this very interesting. So when I was doing residential and box, they were, I needed, you know, a couple hundred thousand basically in order to do a deal. And those people, that had a couple hundred thousand, you know, in their RSPs or something like that would come along and joint venture with me. And so the finding the capital for though that sandbox was, was easy. I did not have any multi-million dollar social impact investors in that sandbox or in my life at that time. Zero. So didn't know a millionaire. Interesting enough, now that I'm in a different sandbox, leveraging in my experience, of course, I'm having, I'm attracting multimillionaires that have a, a passion to see their money being used for good and so social impact. So I have, it's, it's, it's mind blowing to me, but over my, because of my persistence, because of my diligence and my tenacity, I have a list of multimillionaires that are. Uh, social impact investors that aren't looking for a 10%, 15, 20 on their funds. They just are happy with the three to 7% return. They're not donators. They're not just going to give their money away to a nonprofit. They want to see a return. They want to hold on to their capital so they can repeat it again uh, mm -hmm. in another project. So they're coming in slow and sure. Mm -hmm. There is one deal, <laughs> one deal that I have been working on since the end of January and God bless this investor. And I, she is one of my favorite people. And she said yes to me at the end of January is an out the side, outside of the box investment. It's pioneering. It is not your normal LLP. It's not your just, you know, in and out. It is a new way of investing. And so I just, love her because she has been journeying along with me from the end of January. We still have not closed the deal. We are very close to closing this deal. And when we close this deal, I will be within uh, a hand reach of that, of my goal of that billion dollars in order to, to radically revitalize the neighborhood. So. Wow. That's, that's so, so inspiring. And I look, I hear this story a lot that when you're very clear on your vision and it's clearly not about you. It's not about having a Cherie statue erected in the middle of the new town square. You know, it's uh, it's um, <laughs> absolutely coming from, you know, the the passion of not from fear, but the passion of wanting to see real change uh, for some higher good that I you know really feel is genuine and the reason I know it's genuine is because I can see your perseverance and when we're coming from that mm. that fear space of oh I, I don't want to die feeling that I haven't made my contribution that I haven't been a person of significant that's totally different when we're coming from that fear-based space we uh, eventually we run out of energy we run out of steam we don't have anything driving us anymore but what you're talking about here is almost like you know perseverance beyond what normal people would expect um, oh, yeah. people to do you know it's just <laughs> absolutely in a in a whole new realm and it's almost like I feel the universe is testing us it's going okay mm -hmm. we're going to put a few it's going to be like one of those uh you know a steeplechase where you have a series of hurdles that you have to jump over and if you can cross the finishing line then we'll throw some interesting investors your way does it feel that way to you <laughs> Cherie <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> very much so absolutely yeah. 
If we have time, I'd love to share about James Rose. And I want to tell you that this isn't just a pie in the sky kind of vision, but mm. I did some research on other revitalization leaders that were successful. And so yeah. James Rose is one of those people. And he was a developer back in the 60s. And mm. he decided that in his development, that 50% would go to black people and 50% would go to white people. And that's a huge thing back in 1960. And mm -hmm. so what he decided that once he has sold that last place, piece of land to a white person, the next person was had to be black, even though he would have made significant more money if he just sold this whole development to white people at that time. There is, if you go onto YouTube and you look at James Rouse and you look at his autobiography, there's a 30 second clip of this black woman, and, and if you blink, you'll miss it. But I'm telling you, it was the best part of the whole hour that I watched. And what she said was because of James Rouse, because of the fact that he gave our family the opportunity to purchase land in his development, there is generational, we got out of poverty and we have never gone back. Mm -hmm. And I just thought to myself, what kind of developer do I want to be? Do I want to be a developer with multi-million dollars in my bank? Or do I want to be known as the developer that was able to help a family out of poverty? And if I can help one family out of poverty by providing an opportunity to own, and own their own place, I don't have all the details around that, how I'm going to do that quite yet. But if I'm that known as that developer, I feel like I've definitely done my, that is the type of developer I want to go to my grave mm -hmm. as. Yeah, that is so inspiring. And I've been a developer in the past and we get tarnished with a brush. I felt that sometimes, some points we were seen as, you know, one rung up from a used car salesman. So to put a whole reframe on yeah. the, the concept of development, it's not just for about, you know, filling our pockets, but actually creating, making a better world because you can, because you've got that vision. So thank you for sharing that story, um, Shri. That's I love the idea of the you know that ripple effect that that one action can can have a number of multiplying actions like an exponential effect that you probably have no idea of uh, or no notion of. Yeah. So let's finish. I'd just like to just get you to answer this question, if you would, to anyone who maybe wants to make a big impact on the world, but they're not as far progressed. And maybe they didn't have that foundation, um, that Salvation Army Foundation that you had and might be struggling with self-doubt, but they, they definitely have a sense of how they would like to play their part in making the world a better place. What would you say mm -hmm. to someone in that position in their lives? Yeah, uh, don't give up. That's number one. There are so many stories. Listen to all the stories of all the people that didn't give up and got their dreams. There's actually a book and I can't, I'm so sorry, I have to send you the title of it, but it's a whole book of story after story of people that didn't get up, didn't give up, that got their, they were successful and got their dreams. And it could be one guy that was, you know, walking across an, a country in Africa in order to find a better life for himself. It could be Mother Teresa, who had to ask 13 times before the Pope gave her permission to stop teaching wealthy Catholic parents' children and move to Calcutta. It could be, you know, like, uh, it could be, I was thinking uh, another, like, I just, I, I just immersed myself in stories that, it, you know, what we put into ourselves is what's come out. So we have to be careful with what we listen to and what we put in. And so I was just, I would read books that were all about people that were successful because they didn't give up. I watched videos on anyone that, you know, their story was, I didn't give up. And because of that, I'm successful today. I was in a restaurant a couple weekends ago with an investor and on the wall were all these famous people. And I just thought to myself, they were famous because they didn't give up. So number one, don't give up and surround yourself with stories of people that don't give up. Don't mm -hmm. hang out with people who are balloon poppers. Be careful who you share your vision and your dream with. 
because there are people who love to pop your balloons even before they get to rise very high in the sky. So be careful who you hang out with and hang out with people that, that believe in you and believe in your vision. Those are three things that I would do that I have done that have made a world of difference and why I still do. Also take care of yourself physically take care of yourself, mentally take care of yourself, prayer and meditation at the beginning of the day, physical working out and and physically, you know, you need your health. So take care of yourself so that during the day when those challenges come up, you are mentally and physically well enough in order to deal with them and just, yeah, have a phenomenal team, a team of people Mm -hmm. around you that when those challenges come, you can reach out to them and they can have they have the experience and the expertise in order to guide you in the right way so that you're not like me who found myself alone and confused but instead have learned from that so learn from my mistakes so around mm-hmm. yourself with a massively wonderful team and yeah and i can be one of those people so you can call <laughs> me anytime Thank you, (laughs) Sheree. That's so inspirational. And I think not only are you going to create the neighbourhood, I think that's inevitable, but I think also you're going to inspire so many people to really rise to the challenge um, just because of the the scale of what you're doing. That's a balloon that's very easy to pop. And the fact that you're hanging in there, I think is going to inspire a lot of other people to have courage and step forward and rise to their particular challenge as well. So thank you very much for appearing on Wake the F Up and being such a leading light. Thank you so much, Janet. Really appreciate your words today. Thank you. You have just listened to another enlightening episode of Wake the F Up with Janet Hogan. To find out more about the breakthrough guided way to get off the hamster wheel and seize a life of freedom and fulfillment, visit janethogan.com slash podcast for access to the show notes and to learn more about Janet's breakthrough work. Just remember, finding your true path isn't potluck. It's a process. Until next time.